had some time to catch up on things, emails, messages. I'm beginning to look more at this thing as a whole. I'm anxious as to what it will be, plot, and the lack there of plot. It's almost like I need to divert and write about something completely different in order to resolve this thing, or to come to some conclusion, which I don't foresee. To continue writing through all of whatever this is, to surrender to the idea that I cannot know what will happen, even though my ego so desperately thinks it can know what will happen. The idea of writing and ending, it's an impossible task. The idea of ending, to truly understand what an ending is, it's incomprehensible to us. An old friend of mine, he just had a baby. It was his bris. They were in Vancouver. They sent a link to the live stream at the synagogue there. I opened it on my computer. It showed the bima and four empty chairs. There was a tapestry of a tree and a Jewish star. There was a gooseneck microphone on the ground, which was plugged into the wall. The room was oddly empty. I scrolled through the past two hours of video that was there. I saw that a man appeared. He stood next to the bima and looked at his cell phone for a few minutes. He reached over to a book and moved it and then left. He returned after another 15 minutes. This time he stood with his back to the camera. After a few minutes, he left the frame again. There was something that made me happy about how dumb it was to sit in the empty room that I was in and stare at this empty room on the other side of the country. I ate a turkey sandwich while the live stream played. I looked at some books on the library website. I felt like I was wasting time and that I should focus on doing more writing. I wrote about the structure of this book and tried to talk myself out of trying to apply any logic of what it was leading towards a certain climax or to develop any kind of resolution. Instead, I saw it best to ignore the structure and to focus as much as possible on moving forwards. Regardless of my judgment, I felt grateful for the shape of the book and a sense of knowing that I will not be able to look back and say that I wasn't fully immersed in the soup of all of this. And that immersion, I'll admit to you that I've found a new confidence that I've grown due to this. And so, if you needed a point to this book, that is it. That is all, all it ever intended to be. And it worked. It was very fucking hard, but it worked. I have succeeded. And so, in that success, in that resolution, I have to write the only ending I possibly can. At the age of 37, I died. I'm not sure what killed me. I was walking on the sidewalk, lost in thought, and the best I can describe it, that I felt like a metal door shut in my face. It swallowed me, more or less. There was some kind of pain that was beyond what I'd ever known, but it was so fast I barely even knew that it happened. It was like I hit my nose onto something, and then I felt there was a desperate reach of something, and I thought of the people that I love, but mostly I thought about my daughter Nora. An eternity passed momentarily, and then I came to. I was inside of a wooden box. The panic I felt was more severe than anything I'd experienced before, but it gave me an immense power that allowed me to break through the box with relative ease. I dug upward through the dirt, choking in the weight of it, until I tore through a patch of grass and saw my name carved into a tombstone. There were a few rocks there. I wondered who had put them there. It was quiet in the graveyard. The sun was bright but covered at the moment by a passing cloud. I liked the suit I was dressed in. At first I thought it was black, a black suit but covered in dirt, but after I shook it off I realized it was a dark brown suit, much like the color of dirt. I wasn't very far from the house. I'd been in this graveyard with Miriam and Nora before when we got lost on the Beltline path. I remembered family camped out at a relative's grave with their minivan and some coolers. I walked about an hour and a half home. I stopped and got a coffee on the way. I returned to my desk and began to write about what had happened. 
When I sat at my computer, I saw that the live stream of the bris was still going. The room was still empty. There was another book on the bima. I wondered if I would need a bris again, myself, after being through what I had. I thought about writing a new introduction to this book, or a preface, and realized I didn't know the difference between the two. I went on to Google and tried to figure it out. It didn't really matter. I suppose I just had the urge to write a new beginning, because it seems that when you know what the ending is, only then can you really know where to begin. It seemed like I knew for a moment what the ending was when I died, but it seems now that since I've been resurrected, I'm confused again. It seems like this entire book is one long preface to a book that doesn't exist. I went on YouTube and watched trailers for some new movies that were coming out. I felt irritated for the most part. This category of irritation had been on my mind. It is on the mood tracker I'd been using that the psychiatrist suggested to me. And it seems more than depression, anxiety, and elation, I always score high with the irritation. I wrote for too long. I didn't go downstairs for breakfast as soon as I should have, and I was making Miriam late. When we were trying to get her out of the house, I said at one point, I don't have enough fucking hands, which I regretted saying. We were at a friend's house last weekend, before I died and was resurrected. It was my first time meeting them, but they've known Miriam for a long time. They cooked us a remarkable meal, a grilled peach salad, beans they'd grown in their yard. It was really amazing, and I did like these people. I was quiet for the most part, but when the topic of TV came up, I was able to connect. At a certain point, I felt like I was being aggressive somehow, that I was assaulting them with the detail and my thoughts on everything. At some point, the guy said that anyone who doesn't completely want a kid and has one is an idiot. I understood what he meant, but I'm clearly one of those people. No matter how much Nora has completely changed my life, my entire perspective, and fundamentally changed the shape of my brain, I love her in a way that transcends any love I've ever felt before, but still, being a parent is difficult. It is very fucking hard. And I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. I wasn't sitting around waiting and hoping and dreaming of having a child. More so, Miriam wanted a baby, and so we had one. To me, there was nothing to think about. Having kids is what people do. To think that you get to make that decision. I will never have kids. I don't want kids. That's what doesn't seem right to me. For me, having kids, if it happens, it is a part of life. It seems to me that when it happens, it happens. Despite how in control we think we are, the human race finds its way of continuing onward, and it is much bigger than us. Still, it has been very difficult for me. I'm unsure what it's like for other dads, for those who claim to have known wholeheartedly that they wanted to be a father. And so, inevitably, there is a part of me that feels some part guilty and some part ashamed as a result of my irritation. I've been reading over some writing I'd done about a year ago, when I was still working as an instructor at the film school. There's something I wrote down that Miriam said then. I don't know if you'll like being a stay-at-home dad. It's very hard to admit the reality of that, but to admit the difficulty of it, to describe the grievance, perhaps I need to allow myself to talk about the struggle of it all. I went to get Nora's room ready so that when we got home from daycare, I didn't have to fuss with it. I lay out her pajamas, I closed the blinds and organized her stuffed animals and her books. I had to admit, despite all the difficulty that I felt, I was getting better at this. I've learned a lot about this line of work in the past year and a half. I pushed Nora's stroller to the daycare. I thought of the medication I was going to start, this feeling that I would need it in order to make it through. Now that I have a kid, it seems I need to live in the world. Leaving this job is impossible. There's no uprooting like I'm so used to doing. There's no end to it, and I struggle with that somehow. As I've struggled with holding down most any job I've ever had in the past, when I picked Nora up from daycare, one of the teachers saw me in the window and said, It's Nora's daddy. 
this new role to be seen as a dad, the humility and innocence of it, the responsibility that comes with it. On the stroller ride home, Nora took off her shoes and then her socks, and then she tried to put her shoes back on to her bare feet. She pulled out the clips that Miriam had put into her hair. She dropped the pink one into the seat of the stroller, but played with the yellow one on the ride home. When we turned the corner onto our street, I remembered yesterday, Miriam had told me to make sure to wipe all the Cheerios from the stroller so that the squirrels wouldn't climb in. I picked Nora up and brushed all the Cheerios off, accidentally sending one of her hair clips, the pink one, flying into the yard. I held Nora. We looked in the bricks and in the dirt. Where the fuck was it? I took her upstairs and put her down for her nap. We read Five Stinky Socks, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, and The Hungry Caterpillar. I watched her on the baby monitor. We changed the angle on it to give us a bird's eye view of the crib, which seemed to be much better. Nora lifted her head for a moment, yawned, and snuggled her bunny rabbit. I felt a rush of endorphins at the pit of my stomach. She was fast asleep. I came back outside and scanned the ground. Dried leaves, grass, dirt, the corner of a wrapper from one of Nora's snacks. I couldn't find it anywhere. I noticed my thoughts, how I began to concoct excuses and lies as to how I would tell Miriam that I'd lost the pink clip. I sat and worked on my writing while Nora napped. When she woke up, I changed her diaper and we played in her room. We played with her blocks, destroying the towers we built. We made her stuffed animals kiss and fed them from her empty bottle. She brought me a book from her shelf. I read a page. She went back to the bookshelf, brought me another book. I read another page. She brought another book, a page, a book, a page, a book, until they were all on the ground. We built a tower from the books and destroyed it. The yellow hair clip was pinned onto the pocket of my shirt. Nora took it, and she laughed as we clipped it on to Bunny, then Maxi Cat, then Sloth, then Lexi. We went downstairs and ate some snacks, cheese, oranges, leftover rice. When Miriam came home, she took Nora and I began making a split pea soup for us to eat for dinner. While I fried the onions, I thought about how there are no boundaries with the baby. That is part of what it is. It's their duty to push you past your limits. It's their duty to break you. And there's no stopping them. After dinner, we went on a walk. Nora had a tantrum and wouldn't go into her stroller. I couldn't help but laugh, seeing the extent of how angry and hysterical she was. It was probably true that in her year and a half of life, this was possibly one of the worst, if not the worst thing that had ever happened to her. Through the pitch of her desperate scream, I felt an incredible love for her. We let her walk for a bit. She stopped every two steps to admire an ant, to try to pick a flattened raisin from the sidewalk, to touch a dandelion. We put her back into the stroller. This time, Miriam bribed her with the squeezy pack and kept her focused by doing itsy bitsy spider. Nora then yelled and pointed to an airplane. She squeezed her juice pack. It went all over her arm and cheek. I knelt down to get some baby wipes from under the stroller. And there it was. The pink hair clip. I talked to my dad on the phone for about half an hour. He told me about a curling shot he'd made last year. His teammate told him it would be impossible, that he couldn't do it. Watch me, my dad said. And he made the shot with ease. He described the way the rock snuck between two, cracked against another, and did exactly what he said they would. He laughed on the phone when he told me about it. After we talked, Miriam and I ended up looking at pictures of Nora on her phones. She'd grown so much in these past months. We watched a bit of TV before bed. When I was falling asleep, I had another idea about the potential new introduction to the book. I had a feeling that even if I wrote it, I wouldn't end up using it. If anything, I would probably just leave it where it was chronologically written, but likely it seemed like the kind of thing that would get deleted. In the morning after we dropped Nora off at daycare, we went to the coffee shop. I worked on putting my manuscript together, compiling all the parts and formatting them, skimming through different sections. I felt like I was doing the work I was meant to do. I felt a momentary sense of elation thinking of what this book has become. I was still very concerned, however, about the beginning. It felt too fragmented, too lifeless, which I suppose was how I felt at the time as well. 
It was true to what was going on at the time, but it needed something more. I thought of cutting it off completely, beginning the book when it catches its stride. But there was something to it I couldn't let go of. I thought of using this very paragraph as an introduction to excuse what was to come and to assure the reader that it would sort itself out. But similarly to what I was thinking before bed the night before, I didn't want to disrupt the chronology of how all of this was written. I was anxious for my doctor's appointment that afternoon. I felt increasingly superstitious that it landed on the eve of the Jewish New Year. The thought of how the meds might change me, of how they might affect this writing process, how they might contaminate it, how it seemed more than anything in my mind taking them would become merely a plot point for this novel. I felt the side of me that I had spent the last decade bearing in sobriety. I was excited about taking these meds. And I couldn't wait for the relief and the high that might come. Even after all these years, I could see that inner bastard hadn't changed a bit. And somehow, all I could think was that no matter what happens, writing this book, the one that comes after, the one that comes after that, that would always be there for me, no matter what happened. I thought about my resurrection. Perhaps I should begin the book with that, talking about my insignificant death. My doctor appeared on my computer screen. Her demeanor seemed a lot more gentle than before. We went through the report that the psychiatrist made for her. After two and a half pages of describing everything we'd talked about in the meeting the week before, there was his formal impression as to what was going on with me, his diagnosis. PDD, Persistent Depressive Disorder, GAD, Generalized Anxiety Disorder, Polysubstance Use, DO, and Sustained Remission, Cluster B Traits, ADHD, By History, RO, ASD, RO, Bipolar, DO. Overall, the main diagnosis seemed to be persistent depression and anxiety with some degree of emotional dysregulation, perhaps indicative of underlying bipolar diathesis, though unclear whether the threshold of hypomania has been met. We considered whether an overarching diagnosis of a personality disorder and or ASD could better capture his experience. He describes a constellation of symptoms suggested of BPD. While he does not appear to meet criteria BPD at present, I wonder whether residual symptoms could help to explain emotional dysregulation. We discussed starting a trial, Bupropion XL, to address depression as well as anxiety and ADHD symptoms. Start at 150 milligrams for four weeks increased to 300 to 450 milligrams as needed. We discussed monitoring for the emergence of hypomanic manic symptoms and or a worsening in anxious symptoms. My doctor then told me about the side effects of Welbutrin. I should have written them down. She said that she sent the prescription to the pharmacy. It would be ready that night. We went for Rosh Hashanah dinner at Miriam's cousin's house. Nora played with the wooden cow and loved looking at the big orange fish in the fish tank. I sat beside her during dinner and fed her matzo ball soup. Afterward, I dropped her and Miriam at home and went to the drugstore to pick up my prescription. There was nowhere to park because everyone was Jewish in our neighborhood and having their own Rosh Hashanah dinners found a spot on the street that I wasn't sure was exactly legal. I ran in and the pharmacist gave me the paper bag with my prescription in it. Have you taken these before? She asked. No. Do you have any questions? No. I paid and ran back to the car and drove home. I took the Wellbutrin in the morning. I thought about how to repair the beginning of the book. I was unsure how to feel or what to think about the drug. I felt a certain buzzing in my head. I didn't have the most productive morning. 
I mostly ended up wasting time on YouTube, but I suppose I needed some time to feel things out. I felt like I was being quite talkative on our walk. The buzzing in my head persisted. It was like someone unplugged all the cords in my brain and then plugged them back in to the front behind my forehead. I felt dehydrated and that my focus was more narrow than usual. I had a sense of what the drug might have been doing, but I couldn't discern between what the actual drug taking effect was and what I might be imagining. I printed the, our tickets for synagogue. I wore a white shirt and brown pants and a brown jacket. When I went downstairs, Miriam gave me an apple slice dipped in honey. Nora was wearing a dog cone on her head and walked around the house looking like a lamp with legs. I thought that I should wear the dog cone to synagogue. <laughs> I, I brought Nora onto the couch and sat her beside me. I asked her about the year that had just passed, how it had gone for her, but she didn't want to talk. Instead, she crashed her head on the pillow next to me and slid off the couch and went and got her car toy. Miriam came back down the stairs and threw a fresh diaper at me. We changed Nora and then put her in a blue dress that she'd never worn before. On the way downtown, I couldn't help but notice the way my head was still buzzing. My attention seemed to hyper-focus on things. I watched a construction worker at an intersection. We parked in the lot downtown where my parents once stayed when they were here a few years ago. There was a cafe across the street. We stopped in. Nora was mesmerized by a disco ball on the ceiling. I felt like my feelings had moved to the front of my brain, that the negativity that I knew so well, it had been lifted in a way. There was some kind of weird clarity. I don't know. I ordered an espresso and an almond cake for Miriam. The espresso wasn't very good, but I was happy to drink it on the patio with my wife and my daughter. I counted four security guards and one cop outside the synagogue. We went in and found a spot to sit all the way at the back. Nora loved looking at all the people there. She pulled the bow out of her hair pretty fast. She wouldn't sit still for very long, so Miriam took her to walk around. I stood on my own for the next hour, reading through the book, zoning out, thinking of this new drug, looking at people's outfits. I thought of getting a new suit. I wanted a dark brown one some new black loafers. I read more from the book. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a sacred occasion. You shall not work at your occupations. You shall observe it as a day when the horn is sounded. You shall present a burnt offering, a pleasing odor to Adonai. One bull of the herd, one ram, and seven yearling lambs without blemish the grain offering with them, choice flour with oil mixed in, shall be three-tenths of a measure for a bull, two-tenths for a ram, and one-tenth for each of seven lambs. And there shall be one goat for a purification offering to make expedition in your behalf. In addition to the burnt offering of the new moon, with its meal offering and the regular burnt offering, with its grain offering, each with its libation as prescribed, gifts of pleasing odor to Adonai. I suppose 5,000 years ago, whenever this was written, that is what people needed. And for me, it seems I have 150 milligrams of XL Wellbutrin. Shofar blasted through the auditorium, I thought of how it was a few days earlier, sitting at home in an empty room, watching a live stream of an empty synagogue, and now how it felt standing in the back of the room, full of a few hundred people. Still, I was alone in some way, despite it all. I didn't know exactly what the difference was. 